Good morning. Have a seat. Make yourself comfy. My name is Pastor Mark, and we're excited to have most everybody here. It looks like people got a jump start on the good weather today. A lot of mowing to get done, I would reckon. So <laughs> where two or more are gathered, there he is also. And we got more than two, so that's a good thing. Um, yeah, the weather has been great. The forecast changed mighty quickly on us. We had canceled the bike rodeo Saturday because it looked horrible up until Saturday. And then it was super nice. So stay tuned for rescheduling of that. Today is Pentecost Sunday, 40 days after Easter, the day when Jesus decided to send his Holy Spirit, come down like flaming tongues. And in one day, I believe, 5,000 made the decision to follow Christ. And for believers, the Holy Spirit resides in us. Don't forget that. We're starting a new sermon series today entitled, Make Every Effort. And the thing about us making every effort is the Holy Spirit's right there with us. He co-labors with us as we yield to Him and allow Him in to guide us, to direct us. There's eight passages in the Bible where make every effort is spoken, so it's a theme. We have a stake in the game. Jesus doesn't just wave some magic wand and everything is sunshine and bubbles. In this world, we will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And we've talked a lot about the pattern of the world in our last couple sermon series. The pattern of the world is to make everything easier, right? Easier and more convenient. Why not? I mean, we have the ways and the will and the means. It's human nature. Our flesh wants comfort and low effort. Easy street, right? Those things require zero effort. Long-term growth and discipleship requires effort. Many times maximum effort. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit is a spirit of power and love and self-control. Think on those three things. Power not for our means and ways, but for His. Self-control, yes, for us, but for His kingdom. My granddad ran a 200-acre farm near Chillicothe, Ohio. All kind of livestock and crops. He'd work hard. He gave every effort He'd work in the barn and in the fields all day, and then he'd come home and eat dinner, and then he'd work in the garden till dark. Big garden, too. <laughs> he had a stroke at the age of 60, massive stroke. Was clinically dead at one point. And praise the Lord, he was revived. And he lived another 20 years with a walker. He was 130 pounds. He was fed through a tube for a, for a time. And he never gave up. I think that's why Laura Van Dyke inspires me so much because I see that same determination in her that I saw in my granddad. It was all he could do to get up the steps to the South Salem Methodist Church. But he had a little snapper tractor he'd get on and he'd ride around in the fields and he was, he'd met, he's just something. He was inspiring. One time we were fishing at the back pond and nobody ever fished there much. It was always the front pond and I was reeling in and boy, I'd get close to the end and I felt something. I was like, I think I need to drop it right here. And I pushed the button on my Zebco 33 and it went down and bang. 
biggest bass I ever caught. And granddad's there riding around on his tractor and I was like, I wonder how long that fish is. He whipped out, <laughs> he had a measuring tape, <laughs> 18 and a half inches. And it was a big bass. And he was just always puttering around and making effort. You know, he didn't lay down. And he could have easily. And we all had chores when we went. When we went to visit my other grandparents, we went to the pool and played. But when we went to the farm, there was chores to do. You had a list. And as a young and my job was to burn garbage and pick eggs. And the garbage barrel was in the chicken lot, and it was all sealed off. And I don't know, they had 30, 40, 50 chickens. And I like picking the eggs, but I had to reach under the hens to get some of them. And I didn't like when they pecked me. I really didn't like that at all. So uh, in the auspices of making every effort, I thought it would be a good day while burning the garbage to get a stick and take it off a tree and get it red hot in the fire and take it into a dry and dusty chicken house with straw and put it underneath the hen to get the hen out of the way. I was trying to make every effort, right? My uncle didn't think that was a good idea. I'd never seen him angry at me before or after, but he was angry that day. Praise the Lord, I didn't burn the chicken house down. <laughs> Sometimes what we think is every effort is not correct effort. Farm life is tough. But you know what? We had everything we needed to live a good life with the correct effort. And a lot of times... Making every effort requires common sense. I wasn't using my common sense that day. And common sense isn't as common as it used to be. God doesn't make chairs and tables. He makes trees. There's an effort to be made. So we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11 today. Both Paul and Peter used that phrase, make every effort. 2 Peter 1, 3 through, 11, 3 through 11, starting in verse 3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these... He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. And we'll stop there for a second. Just as farm life is tough, but we had everything we needed to live a good life with effort, Jesus has given us everything we need to live a godly life. Think about that. Christian, you have everything you need to live a godly life. It's there at your disposal. But it requires effort to get to know Him and to know His will through prayer and Bible study and a relationship with Him. Isn't it wonderful that you can have a relationship with the Creator of the universe who made you fearfully and wonderfully? He's not up there and we're down here just waiting to be smitten. He's accessible. Christian, His Holy Spirit lives in you, that spirit of power and love and self-control, that spirit that consists of love, joy, peace, Goodness, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. All nine of those things is what the world is lacking. And you have all that power inside of you. And maybe you can't change the whole world at once, but you can change it one person at a time, starting with yourself. Be the light where you are. 
Without effort, we have no idea what we're capable of. I coached youth sports for 20-some years. My dad was a coach before me. You have no idea what you're capable of. You really don't. You're gifted. And when you apply yourself, you can do more than you ever imagined. And then when you add the Holy Spirit into that, the possibilities are limitless. That make every effort has changed over the years, just in my short 56 years. Make every effort has become doing the minimum required. I'll just do what it takes to get it done. And God calls us to higher places and to more than that. Heart, soul, mind, and strength is how we are to love Him and our neighbor. Mental, physical, spiritual. He has given us very great and precious promises, that verse says. Do you know that? Do you believe that? Very great and precious promises, and His promises are worth every effort. His promises include the pardon of sin, acceptance with God and His favor, adoption into His family, Sons and daughters. When you make that good confession and the Holy Spirit enters you, God sees you as He sees His Son. How good is that? His promises include access to Him. The Word says we can approach His throne with confidence. His Holy Spirit gives us direction in difficulties, protection in dangers. A wonderful testimony just this week, our treasurer, Colleen Wickham, met with me and we were talking about church business, but she shared her testimony of how God saved her from a horrible wreck. I mean, it was, it was about over. And he intervened. And I'm sure each of you has a story like that you can share. He gives us help in temptation. Temptation is not sin. Jesus was tempted in every way, yet never sinned. When you are tempted, we're to make, take our thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. He always provides a way out. His word promises that. You're not doomed by temptation. There is a way out. But you've got to make every effort to take that way out. We have a choice to make. He comforts us in our troubles. He supplies our needs. He gives us an assurance that all things work for our good, for those who are called according to His purpose. He gives us promises of the spirit of adoption, regeneration and sanctification he set into our hearts as a source of joy. We should find joy and assurance in that, knowing that we are children of God, that in a future of an eternity waits with him. This life here is temporary. It's super short. And over all these, the promise of everlasting life and glory. This should spur our every effort. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, I urge you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true act of spiritual worship. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. The battlefield is here. The battlefield is here. Our minds. Who or what is directing your mind? What are you feeding your mind with? Video games? 
distractions from television and cell phones. Everything in moderation is okay, but who or what comes first? Verse 5, 2 Peter 1. For this very reason, because His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life, because of the great and precious promises, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ." Who wants to be ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? As Christians, I think that's what we long for, to be effective and productive. Here's the pathway. Here's the roadway. Verses 5 through 7. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. You ever feel that? Like you forget that you're cleansed of your past sins. We feel dirty and guilty at times, right? Jesus washed that away. His perfect sacrifice, His perfect blood washed that away. I'd like that verse, the 5 through, uh, five through 8 to be put up there. Next one. No, no, back, I guess back to where it has all those uh, goodness and mutual effect. Yes, one more back. Yeah, one more. <laughs> this verse is awesome, this passage, because it gives us GPS for our walk, honestly, and it's a progression. You don't go from believing, just believing faith directly to agape love. You can't make that jump. It's not possible. There's steps that we take. And Peter outlined these, and they're in such wonderful progression that it's amazing. After we make that good confession, we begin the process of, here's a christian word for you, phrase, progressive sanctification. <laughs> All that means is becoming more like Jesus every day. That's the goal, become more like Jesus every day. It's like building a spiritual house, right? Anybody in here a home builder or has built a house before or a shed or maybe even a chicken house? <laughs> There's a proper order, right? And to do it well and with excellence, it requires every effort on our part and you can't skip a step. So what's the first thing when you're constructing a building? What's the first thing you do? You lay a foundation. A foundation has to come first. And faith is the foundation upon which our spiritual house is built. That's where it starts. Make every effort to add to your faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And when you make that good confession and you repent and confess and you believe, that's faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is confidence of what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. It's intangible, yet it's tangible. That's how God works. And a popular phrase in the secular world today that I hear more and more often is, I'm deconstructing my faith. Deconstructing my faith. That's oxymoronic. It really is. When you, when you look at what faith is, it makes no sense. Because faith is foundational, and it's a gift from God. Right? You, you don't... It's a gift from Him. He draws you. He 
His work stands despite our effort to interpret it to suit us. Basically, when you say you're deconstructing your faith, you're saying, I want to make his word fit what my sin is. You can't deconstruct something that's not yours. That's a gift from God. If your hope is truly in an eternity with, Je with Jesus, it can't be deconstructed. It makes no sense. True faith spurs a hunger for God's word and his will, which is good in all ways. Add to your faith goodness. True faith shapes our goodness. And that's an interesting Greek word there. It actually is more like virtuous instead of goodness. It literally means moral excellence. Moral excellence is goodness. God set the standard for morality in his word that does not change. So to achieve goodness is laying our will aside, dying to self, the word says, take up your cross daily and follow me. That doesn't mean oh, I'm just dragging this cross around. No, it means a cross is an instrument of death. You die to yourself every day so that you can wholeheartedly follow Jesus and his will. It's a battle of wills and it happens right here every day. Whose will is going to take precedent? Because God gave you free will. You're made in the image of God. He has free will. He gave his creation free will so that they might choose him. So with faith rooted in goodness, which is basically faith in action. James says faith without works is dead. Our knowledge increases. Faith, goodness, knowledge, and the Holy Spirit's self-control can help us when we're tempted as we continue to yield our will. That's a daily thing. Jesus said, take up your cross daily. And I get it. Sometimes it's multiple times a day we have to die to ourselves, right? Because the enemy never stops. He's always firing stuff at you and trying to get your head turned just a little bit. If he can just get a toehold. And don't get me wrong, Satan has great power. You've heard me say this a million times. Satan has great power, but he has zero authority. None. The only authority Satan ever gets is what you give him when you make a choice to step out in your will instead of God's. Did God really say that? Said that to Eve, right? Did God really say that? Just if he can get you to question just a little bit. Anyone can be self-controlled for a minute, right? Or even a month. But we've got to persevere over the long term to truly be set apart. Go to the next slide. Please. Self-control in and of itself has no time limit. But when you add perseverance to that, when you're self-controlled over the long haul, what happens? When we persevere over the long term, we're truly set apart, which is the definition of holiness, set apart. A vessel yielded to God, godly. Long-term holiness is godliness. Easily agreeing with Scripture. 
I think that's where the rubber meets the road between our will and His. Do we easily agree with Him? You're God. You're Lord and Savior. We love that Savior part, but the Lord part is where He says jump and we say how high. And that takes effort. It doesn't magically happen to go from faith to goodness to knowledge to self-control to persevere in that to godliness to mutual affection and love. It takes effort on our part. It's a determined effort every day. And this world does everything to come against that, to make us unloving. It takes little effort to hate people, really. Because in our flesh, you know, the spirit of offense, I've never seen the likes of it. Like, it's almost like everybody's looking to be offended today. Like, you're looking, you're waiting for somebody to say something so you can twist their words so you can be offended. It almost is like it gives you a reason to live to be offended anymore. I, I've never seen anything like it. And I know it's the work of the enemy. He wants us divided, biting. If biting and devouring one another, you will destroy each other, it says in the Word. And that's where we're going. That's where we're heading. It takes little effort to hate people and maximum effort to love like Jesus. I was not a very loving young man. My testimony starts out, I was born pre-genetically disposed to be short, fat, fair-skinned, red-headed, and cross-eyed. Seriously. And we moved around a lot as a kid, so I was always going to a new school, and man, I had a target on my chest. And it made me very unloving and very uncompassionate. And God had to get in there with his word and circumcise my heart to cut out that hate that the world just fills us with. And it takes effort and it's painful. So like we said, you're not going to jump from faith to agape love. You got to start with mutual affection. Even of those who sin differently than you. Because the Bible says we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And some sins the church likes to just jump on right away. Listen, Jesus was all about diversity, equality, and inclusion. That's a big buzzword today. D-E-I. Diversity, equality, and inclusion. Jesus made us all with different spiritual gifts. He's diverse. He's about diversity. He knows we're all different. He knows we're all wound different and we all think different. Equally, equality, where we're all made fearfully and wonderfully in His image. And inclusion. He wants none to perish. but we have a stake in the game. You see, Jesus met sinners where they are and loved them enough to not leave them there. His word says that He came to call sinners to repentance. He doesn't meet you where you are and say, you're great where you are, keep on sinning. I love you. Just like the woman who was about to be stoned, caught in adultery. What was the last thing he said to her? Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Jesus met sinners where they were and he left them in a higher and a better place. We need to have that same attitude of mutual affection. Instead of being bullhorn guy and yelling at sinners or using the Bible as a weapon to hit them over the head, we need to meet them where they are. 
because it's not my words that calls out sin. You want a good list of sin? Go to Galatians 5, 19 and 20. I guarantee you, you will identify immediately with two or three of those that you probably did this morning. He calls us to higher and to greater places, and it takes every effort. It takes determination. English is such a strange, weak language. There's, there's one word for love, <laughs> one word, and it means a lot of things. There's seven words for love in Greek, and agape or sacrificial love is the goal, and it requires every effort and is the greatest part of our spiritual house. When everything's stripped down, the Bible says these three things remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Agape love, which means sacrificial love, not eros love, which is sexual love, or not Phileo love, which is brotherly love, it's agape love. Offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. We are to be effective and productive in our knowledge, which requires every effort to progress from faith to love. Verse 10, therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort, there it is again, to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. How about that? You make every effort and you walk it, you won't stumble. Doesn't mean Satan's not going to keep firing darts at you. But when you're fully armored up, you're not going to fail because he's there with you. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Following Jesus as his disciple requires every effort to remain surrendered to an agreement with His will. It's a daily regimen that keeps us from stumbling and leads to a rich welcome into His eternal kingdom. And we want to help you with that. That's why I'm here. That's why our elders are here and our staff and our volunteers and our deacons. If you're finding it difficult to love like Jesus... Again, you can't jump straight from having faith to loving unconditionally. I urge you to look at those steps and work on them one at a time. Most times it's our own idea of what faith should look like that needs deconstructing. So that we can properly build our spiritual house in Christ. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Build on your foundation of faith by setting aside your own evil desires that lead to corruption. Choose goodness or moral excellence and read your Bible to know what that looks like. And as your knowledge increases, you yield your control to the Spirit and persevere in that. Be set apart and make a determined effort to feel compassion for and attachment with those made in God's image, which is everyone. Not just who looks like you or acts like you or talks like you. Get outside your comfort zone. Point others to Jesus and sacrificially love them, even when you don't feel like it. Make every effort. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. It's so clear. There is no mystery in what you desire of us. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. To start with our faith and keep building it step by step until we sacrificially love all the time. If there's someone here today, Lord, who the Holy Spirit's really working on, I pray today's the day they make that good confession. They can do it in their seats or as we pray, Lord, I just pray that... Uh, Someone would come forward who hasn't made that good confession, who feels like they're slipping away. One minute to wait is one minute too long when the Holy Spirit's prompting, Lord. Help us to follow His leading and to make every effort, Father, to make every effort to do Your will. We love You and praise You and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen.